Uh, good afternoon. Happy Wednesday. Uh, happy to be joined by uh, Council Members Constantinides and Rosenthal. We both have bills that we're passing today. On today's stated agenda, the Council will vote. <laughs> the Council will vote on the following land use items. We'll be voting on 15 <coughs> landmark designations. Seven of them are located on Broadway, south of 14th Street in Council Member Carlina Rivera's district. Six of the landmarks uh, related to the history of the LGBT movement are being voted on today. Three are in my district. The rest are in Councilmember Chin, Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Rose's district. And uh, I'm really excited that we are marking the incredible history of the LGBT community in New York City by acknowledging individuals like James Baldwin and Audre Lorde and the many organizations that have fought for equal rights. And I really, really want to thank the head of the LPC, Sarah Carroll, for her great partnership in getting this done. She has been a real pleasure to work with. Two additional landmark designations are also happening today, located in Councilmember Powers' district and Councilmember Kalis' district. The other land use items we're voting on today include in addition, the addition of a commercial overlay at 245 East 53rd Street in Councilmember Powers' district and at 35 13 Atlantic Avenue and Councilmember Espinal's district. We'll be voting on the Kew Gardens Hills rezoning located in Councilmember Lansman's district. And finally, on the land use front, we're voting on a UDAP designation and project approval for the Bronx Point project located in Councilmember Ayala's district and Bronxville South located in Councilmember, es uh, Councilmember Espinal and Barron's districts. From the Finance Committee, the Council will vote on a transparency resolution as well as two Article 11 property tax exemptions. The first is Catherine Sheridan Apartments in Councilmember Constantinides' district to preserve 240 units of affordable housing. And the second is Lafayette Morrison Apartments in Councilmember Salamanca's district, which makes an adjustment to the tax exemption that was previously granted by the Council earlier this year. Moving on, the Council will vote on the following pieces of legislation. First, we'll be voting on a repeal bill related to conversion therapy uh, practices. Introduction 1682A, sponsored by myself, would repeal Local Law 22 of 2018 with bans offering conversion therapy services for a fee in New York City. Uh, conversion therapy is harmful and it's a discredited practice that seeks to change a person's sexual orientation to conform with heterosexual norms. Shortly after its enactment, uh, Local Law 22 was challenged in court to avoid the possibility of a negative legal precedent. LGBT advocates, civil rights organizations, legal organizations requested that we repeal our law. Minors will still be protected by the state law that was passed earlier this year by the state legislature and signed into law by the governor. And this was not an easy decision. It was a painful decision. Uh, you know, I'm of course an openly gay man and I got my start in LGBT activism. But after these advocates made this request, uh, we deliberated on it. I felt very torn by it and we decided to repeal the bill. We concluded that this was the best step even though it was a drastic step. The courts have changed considerably over the last few years since we passed the bill, and we sadly cannot count on them to rule in favor of much needed protections for the LGBTQ community. But to be clear, this alleged, alleged therapy is barbaric and inhumane. It is junk science, it is quackery, it is uh, destructive, it is disgusting and harmful, but repealing the law, even with all of that, seems like the best course forward so that we don't have a nationwide chilling effect in case we get a bad decision. And I don't want to risk millions of children who could be protected across the country. So I listened to the advocates who knew the issue best as well as, uh, you know, struggled with it myself. And I'll never stop fighting for the LGBT community. Next, uh, to commemorate New York City Climate Week, the council will vote on a series of climate related bills. Uh, climate, the climate emergency that we're in is the issue of our time and it's incumbent on all of us, particularly those in government to act. The first of our bills is sponsored by uh, the chair of our Environmental Protection Committee, Councilmember Constantinides, who is the leading environmentalist in the city council and always has been. Introduction 49A would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to study the feasibility of utility scale energy storage systems in each city building. Energy storage 
as the next practical step that buildings can take to reduce carbon emissions. It is both useful for storing excess power generated by on-site solar and wind and for drawing power from the grid when emissions are low. DCAS shall install utility style energy storage systems on all, steady, on all city buildings where the study determines that the installation is cost effective. Next is introduction 426A, also sponsored by our chair. It will require that DCAS uh, study the feasibility of solar water heating and thermal energy systems in city buildings. So solar water systems are more energy efficient than so solar uh, photovoltaic systems and may be more cost effective for heating water and building spaces. The next bill, this bill would also require the installation of solar water heating and thermal energy systems where the traditional hot water and space heating equipment has reached the end of its useful life and where it's cost effective. Introduction 1140A, also by the chair, would require an agency or office designated by the mayor to study off-hour deliveries to city facilities and implement such deliveries where it is feasible at city facilities in the Central Business District, Manhattan, south of 60th Street, and at least two highly congested areas outside the Central Business District. Reducing congestion gets cars and trucks off the road, and it's time for the city to be thoughtful about how its own operations contribute to the problem of deliveries and congestion. And so I invite our chair, Councilmember Constantinides, to come up and speak on these three bills. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, and thank you for uh, your strong leadership uh, today and always on environmental issues. And to my colleague, Helen Rosenthal, as well, thank you. Uh, happy Climate Week, everyone. Uh, I wish I could say that full-heartedly, but we saw the IPCC report this morning yet again remind us how dire the situation is. Our oceans are literally cooking. Uh, our world is on fire, and we have to do more. Uh, and in doing that, we need to make sure that we're holding every sector accountable here in our city. Uh, we targeted large buildings just a few months ago with the Climate Mobilization Act, uh, but transportation makes up roughly a quarter of our emissions here in the city. We have unprecedented traffic and worsen any time a truck blocks in a bike lane or a crosswalk or just double parks on a street. Our streets are unsafe. Uh, sometimes you put your life in your hands, uh, bicycling or walking across the street. Uh, you shouldn't have to peer around an idling 18-wheeler to see if a car is coming, let alone breathe in all that smog. In fact, traffic emits one-fifth of the PM 2.5 in New York's air. For those who don't know, this is the worst kind of pollution, and that's stuff that settles in your lungs and causes asthma. Uh, matters are only getting worse as Midtown has slowed 21% over the last nine years. Today is an opportunity for the city to lead by example by requiring that our be a, an assessment of city properties for overnight and off-peak uh, deliveries for our properties in Manhattan and dense parts of Queens and Brooklyn. Uh, this is the first step in making sure that we're part of that solution. 1140-A uh, has some teeth. Once the city studies where it can do overnight deliveries, it must implement the policy to do so. It's not a, just a study bill. It's making sure that we're moving uh, forward on this implementation plan. I remember being a toy store manager in my previous life, mm. and we would schedule our deliveries at 3 a.m. in neighborhoods because we wanted to make sure that we were off the street when the community started, people started going to school, going to work. Um, that was something that I always understood that we can't be blocking streets uh, during uh, you know, key business hours. And I think now having the city do so as well uh, is an important factor. I still remember a truck knocking down a light pole in Jackson Heights on my, <laughs> on my watch uh, you know, more than 20 years ago, going back to, again, a formal life in, in, in working in retail. Uh, we're also passing two bills today that make renewable energy easier to generate and store in city buildings, uh, you know, utility-scale battery storage, making sure that we have a study um, to see where it's feasible in city buildings and implementing that as well. Uh, that's the next step, once not only, not only putting the photo, you know, solar PV on buildings, but having the battery storage, because it's not always sunny. Uh, and as well with the solar uh, thermal bill um, intro, uh, you know, as well. So I want to thank our speaker for all that you do for climate and all of my colleagues. I look forward to continuing to fight uh, for New York City, not just during Climate League, but every day to ensure that we preserve uh, what 250,000 students and young people called for 
real action, bold action, and action that's going to make a difference for their generation. Thanks. Thanks, Costa. Congratulations. Uh, the next bill is also related to Climate Week. It's Introduction 140A, sponsored by Councilmember Steve Levin, and it would require the Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability to conduct a study regarding the feasibility of implementing one or more community choice uh, aggregation programs, community choice aggregation permits, individual electric utility customers to join together to purchase their energy. Their combined market power may allow them to negotiate better rates or demand more renewable energy than they would otherwise be able to purchase individually. If the study recommends impl implementing community choice aggregation, the office shall develop a plan for implementing such programs. I want to congratulate Steve. Next, the council is voting on a small business bill. Our small businesses are the backbone of our economy, so I'm very happy that Council is acting here. Introduction 1410B, sponsored by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, would strengthen the commercial tenant harassment law by changing the current standard of an act or omission that is, quote, intended to cause a tenant to vacate their premises to an act or omission that would reasonably cause a commercial tenant to vacate the property or surrender or waive their rights as a lawful tenant. Furthermore, the bill adds to the current list of behaviors that would constitute tenant harassment, which in, uh, includes continued interruption of essential services, to now include discrimination based on a protected class, and inquiring as to a tenant's immigration status or threatening a tenant based on such status. And I invite Vanessa to come up and speak on this important Thank bill. You. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to all of my colleagues. It's really an honor and a privilege that today the City Council is finally voting on uh, intro 1410B, uh, which is known as the commercial um, harassment legislation. And I am really, really grateful to be uh, part of this council, but also to have worked so closely with many of the advocacy groups that represent so many small businesses across the city of New York. Uh, for me, I learned a lot about the impact uh, that harassment had on our commercial tenants when we passed the Jerome Rezoning Neighborhood Plan in 2017. And although we provided a lot of safeguards and protections, we had a certificate of no harassment that we also implemented to really protect tenants in the residential industry. We learned from a lot of our small businesses along Jerome Avenue. Many of them are immigrant businesses. Many of them provide services in the automobile and car repair industry along Jerome Avenue. And many of them were under the threat of their landlord. Uh, we had businesses like a car wash whose rent increased. He was not able to afford his rent. And in doing so, the landlord threatened him by cutting off the water. Um, and so tactics like that that we know happen far too often across the city of New York, a lot of tenants felt the weight of that harassment and they felt that, like they had no outlet and they had nowhere to go. And so providing this level of safeguard and protection is really our effort to send a message to the larger community that we will never accept any form of harassment, whether it's residential or whether it is commercial. And so as the speaker alluded, this bill does set the current standard for commercial tenant harassment. Um, he talked about the expanding the kinds of acts and omissions that actually constitute commercial tenant harassment, which are now including threatening a commercial tenant based on the tenant belonging to a protected category, uh, requesting identification that would disclose their citizenship status, um, or unreasonably refusing to cooperate with tenants' permitted repairs of construction activities. Uh, in this bill, we are also increasing the civil penalties for landlords that commit commercial tenant harassment from $10,000 to $50,000 for each property in which the tenant was subject to harassment. And when a landlord has been found to have engaged in commercial tenant harassment, the courts can now order the Department of Buildings to not approve, issue, or renew documents for certain types of construction work that would be done by the owner. Um, I think when you look at the city, when you look at all of the development that is happening across the city of New York, small businesses have the least amount of protection. And this legislation takes us a step forward and provides them with additional safeguards. So I am grateful to the United Small Businesses Coalition, a number of community-based organizations that have joined this effort, including a WEDCO, Cooper Square Committee, the Fourth Arts Block, 
uh, Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition that's in my district, uh, the Street Vendor Project under UJC, which is Urban Justice Center, uh, and Volunteers of Legal Services, VOLS. Uh, when I did my rezoning, VOLS came into our district and provided free civil legal services for many of our businesses that were facing the threat of harassment. So today is a great day for the small businesses across the city of New York. I'm also very proud to say that we have the support of REBNY, the Real Estate Board of New York, and they wrote an article today where they believe that this bill strikes a delicate but necessary balance in achieving what we want to do in terms of protection, but also making sure that we send a message to those bad neighbors that would threaten their tenants under harassment. So I am thankful to our small business committee chair, Chair Mark Joni, the members of the small business committee, as well as our speaker, Corey Johnson. I look forward to this bill passing later on today and really want to thank the legislative division who worked so hard around the clock to make this bill what it is today. So thank you. Looking forward forward to it being voted on by the full council. Thanks. Thank you, uh, finally, the council is voting on two bills and a resolution that will help prevent homemade firearms from becoming more common in New York City. The last thing that we need in the city is more guns. And with both of these bills, I'm proud the council is anticipating a problem and proactively taking steps to prevent it from getting worse. The first is resolution 866A, sponsored by Councilmember Danique Miller, and it calls on the United States Congress to reintroduce and pass the 3D Firearms Prohibition Act and calls on the president to sign it. Next, uh, introduction 1548, it's also sponsored by Councilmember Miller, would require the, FD, the NYPD to report on the number of seizures of ghost guns and 3D printed guns, which can also be made at home using materials and equipment that someone can buy online. 3D guns are dangerous for everyone, including the people who try to use them. It's important that we not only prohibit these weapons in New York City, but that we are tracking the seizures of these guns so we can monitor the problem, make sure that it does not get worse. And lastly is introduction 1553A, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, which would make it a misdemeanor to possess an unfinished lower receiver, which is a piece of metal that can be ordered online and turned into a gun without a serial number or registration number. It's referred to as a ghost gun. There is absolutely no reason for anyone to use this other than to make an illegal firearm. So I am proud that we are prohibiting New Yorkers from owning or selling these items. And I first want to invite Councilmember Miller up to speak on his resolution and bill, and then Councilmember Rosenthal to speak on her important bill. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. Um, good afternoon. T today this body will be voting on a package of legislation that uh, I worked on with Councilmember Helen Thaw with the leadership of Speaker Johnson um, to address a new threat that, that threatens our city and our communities, and that is ghost guns. As was indicated, 1553 will, will ban the possession of unfinished frames and, and receivers, and, and my bill, 1548, will require reporting of NYPD on the seizure of these uh, guns. Uh, Resolution 886, which we also sponsored, calls on Congress, Congress to introduce, reintroduce the 3D Firearm Prohibition Act. This package of legislation will keep dangerous and untraceable ghost guns off the streets. We recently, online sellers have been, online sellers have been advertising and selling unfurnished guns in New York, highlighting the fact that they are untraceable and the lack of, because of their lack of serial numbers. Essentially, we are faced with do-it-yourself guns on the streets of New York. Just a few weeks ago, uh, in Oneonta County, uh, the district attorney banned them based on the illegal ghost guns that have infiltrated uh, Syracuse, New York. We would be foolish to believe that this trend would not be coming our way. By banning unfinished lower frames of these guns we, and requiring the reporting on the seizures, we are effectively curtailing the sale of, and, of, of these weapons before they show up on our streets. But that is not the case. That has changed a little bit from, from the time that we introduced that to, to what we see today. So um, I, I also recommend uh, our Attorney General, Tish James, who earlier this week um, stopped companies from ordering uh, do-it-yourself assault rifles 
selling do-it-yourself assault rifles online here in New York State. So we see already the proliferation of what is happening with these guns, and, and, and I, I'm uh, proud that we'll be voting on this legislation that will not only get out in front, but really uh, allow us to regulate and track um, uh, the proliferation of these guns. And, and we have, uh, contrary to um, what we read, we've seen a tick in gun violence throughout the city of New York, particularly in Southeast Queens. And, and, and certainly, uh, we want to do something to address this. So I, I, I again, I commend my colleagues uh, for the work on this package and certainly the speaker for, for his vision and his support and leadership. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson. I'm very proud to sponsor this legislation along with Councilmember Miller, Chair Richards, and the public advocate. We're uh, also honored ha to have the support of Every Town for Gun Safety and Moms Demand Action. Every year in this country, thousands die from gun violence and tens of thousands are injured. While New York City stands out for its common sense gun laws and declining homicide rate, a critical loophole in gun safety has emerged in the form of ghost guns. Through our legislation, which makes it illegal to possess or dispose of an unfinished frame or receiver in New York City, we will join with California and New Jersey in closing this loophole and setting an important precedent for other cities and states to follow. Purchasing an unfinished receiver, which is essentially 80% of a gun, is a common method of creating a ghost gun. From there, all it takes is a quick trip to a local hardware store or a one minute Google search to find what you need to complete the firearm. These guns have no serial numbers. They are virtually untraceable by law enforcement. Criminals seeking a firearm have readily available way to bypass background checks and licensing laws. And that's why we're taking action now. And I'm so proud to stand with you, Councilmember Miller. Earlier this summer, the NYPD reported to us that they have seized 67 ghost guns since the beginning of 2017. And they expressed support for our bill. Upstate law enforcement agencies have also begun to seize these untraceable weapons. One upstate county, as has been mentioned, Anandaga, currently has more than 20 criminal cases involving ghost guns. We cannot go backwards when it comes to gun violence. We must take every possible measure to block untraceable weapons in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Thanks, Johnson. Helen. Uh, very important package of bills. So that is today's agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. First, any on-topic questions? Yeah, Katie. Yes. Chair. So we actually thought, I don't know if Vanessa weigh in, but I think my sense from talking to the uh, staff and uh, the council member and the folks who worked on this, uh, the bill always contained language to strengthen the commercial tenant harassment law and the additional language for the certificate for no harassment pilot program was taken out for later consideration. Um, there were a variety of sort of complicating factors that some of the advocates pointed out to us and the advocates were fine with this change. It wasn't done by external pressure of people who didn't want it. It was thinking through the, um, how difficult it actually was to implement this and that's why in working with the advocates we came to this conclusion while leaving the prospect of figuring out that pilot program on C, uh, on uh, certificates of no harassment for the future once we figure that out with the advocates. But Vanessa, 
fill in the blanks if I right. miss Right, no, something. just as the speaker said, so originally we did talk about the pilot and doing an actual certificate, similarly to what Council Member Lander's bill related to in the residential industry, um, but through the course of working with many of the advocates um, that represent small businesses, that represent many throughout the city that have been victims of harassment, we obviously wanted to achieve something that we could get uh, common ground on, and we recognize that the pilot was something that we obviously wanted to do a little bit more work on and a little bit more research. And so that remains on the table. I want to make that clear uh, that the pilot does remain on the table. But for now, the advocates were completely on board. The United Small Business Coalition were on board with moving forward um, in the way the bill was stipulated today and to continue discussions around the pilot. So you're still kind of taking that on as a work? Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Do you know when? Um, sooner than later. <laughs> 2020. Well, my goal is to make sure it's done before I leave the council. <laughs> That's a good time frame. Thank you. Anna? Um, can you just clarify the question on the scope of Sure. How is this different um, than the provision on the use of guns that the state has to yeah, let me see. I don't know the answer, but I want to make sure we get you the uh, most accurate information. I'm not sure how it is different. Brian, do you want to weigh in? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what we're doing Come up here. Yeah, what we're banning is the, the actual metal that you buy from an online distributor that gets, it comes here it's essentially what well, looks like a gun, you have to drill a couple holes into it, and then you have yourself an operable firearm, as opposed to a 3D printed gun, which is like from the printer itself, made from start to completion. Gotcha, so this is basically like doing this one online. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Also, the state banned the 3D printed, this bans the frame, gotcha. which, is, which is the most integral part. No, yes. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Most of the talk was around, uh, obviously, the 3D printing yeah. and, and so forth, and, and neglected the fact that meat and potatoes was actually the first. Yes. Well, this, you know, this bill just takes a hard look at our city facilities, right? And first, we study lower than uh, Manhattan, lower than the canal, then. Manhattan lower than 60th, then we have those two locations in the boroughs. So we want to make sure that the city is being part of the solution. And we also are demonstrating that this is, this is feasible, right? These are things that can happen, that can have a meaningful impact in reducing congestion, making our streets safer. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be other conversations about how we do off-hour you know, off deliveries, off-peak deliveries in the private sector. I'm, I know they're having those discussions as well, but this only mandates that we are, the city is taking a hard look and how we can get it done. Sure, we can get you the information. Yeah. Happy to get it to you. Any other on topic questions? Okay, off topic. Joe. Off topic. Um, I'm just curious, you know, part of the stimulus now uh, in this bill that's coming in is the common sense. They sort of remove the tax levy from here. Uh, we talked to Joe and Brown about uh, against retirement plans. I'm just curious, do you, do you feel, and I've been sitting here on the council for years, they want a lot of support. They were trying to drill out. No, I mean, we are an independent branch of government and we set our own legislative agenda. Um, you know, the mayor called for this in uh, January or February at his state of the city and uh, we gave it a hearing um, and we are looking at the bill, but I have explained my reservations in the past, which uh, predominantly center around the number of employees 
uh, on how you would define uh, how, who this would apply to. And I'm talking about the, the paid vacation. So, um, you know, I'm, I, we set our own agenda here. We always have, we always will. We're an independent branch of government. I'm not concerned about that. On the retirement uh, fund push, you know, it, it, it's a worthy idea and it's something that I think is interesting. And I know the mayor spoke about it at length on New York One the other night on Monday night when he was asked how's this different than a person just opening up their own uh, IRA account or retirement account. And he said a lot of people don't do it, so we want to help them actually set it up. I think it was a good thing. But there's a pending uh, case in California that we're looking at, and we want to see how it plays out. I've been working closely with Councilmember Miller and Councilmember Kalos on it. Uh, but again, the mayor doesn't set our legislative agenda. We set our legislative agenda, um, and uh, we'll continue to do that. No. Any other off topic? Joe. I have to learn more about it. We have a lot of land use items going on right now. We've, of course, been focused on uh, getting Rikers Island closed down. Um, and there are some other pretty substantial uh, rezoning issues and land use issues that we're looking at. I don't know enough about all the details on it. Uh, I know that the land use staff here has been working with Council Member Chaka. I know that uh, Mr. Kimball from uh, Industry City has been seeking to meet some of the uh, demands and, and, and asks that Council Member Chaka has made. Uh, clearly there is significant community concern and I think for the most part you've seen in this council both while I've been speaker and before I was speaker that you know 98 percent, 99 percent of all ULERPs that get certified get negotiated and the local council member figures out how to make it work. I think that's a good standard for us to operate under that we negotiate we improve the project from community board all the way through to when it gets to the council it's not always possible and in this instance i don't know enough to determine but i think that a local member's concerns are incredibly important and a local member understands their uh, district in a way that other council members don't because we're so busy dealing with our own districts. We can't know every concern across the city. Council member Lander knows more about the Gowanus neighborhood rezoning than any of us will ever know on it because of the amount of time he's worked on it. And the same thing with council member Chaka. Will there be instances of projects that have borough wide significance that have city wide significance where a decision may need to be made that it's not just about that local council member? Yes, that may need to happen at some point. I'm not sure that industry city, I don't know, when I have to learn more about it. I'm not sure Industry City yet rises to that occasion because there all there are all sorts of hyper local concerns involved. But I, I hope it gets to a good place, and I know that Councilmember Chaka continues to meet with Industry City representatives about actually getting to a finish line. He laid out in a community presentation what are the things are that he needs. He did that, I believe, last week, and I know that Industry City is now seeking to address those those concerns and get to a good place. But I don't know, I don't understand each, every specific thing that he's asking for. I haven't, I haven't gone into that level of detail yet because it hasn't been certified. When it, usually when it comes to me, it's after it's at the City Planning Commission and it's coming to the City Council and I'm seeking to help with the administration and the Department of City Planning and the council member. That's usually when it comes to me. At this point, it's so early in the process, it hasn't gotten to me yet. Rich. I mean, I don't want to talk about everything that we've discussed, uh, but you know, we talked about some of the big issues that are facing the city. We talked about um, the plan to close Rikers Island. We talked about uh, the future of uh, NYCHA. We've talked about uh, you know a, a variety of bills that are before the city council. We talked about 
uh, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Plan. We talked about the Morningside Heights region. We talked about a lot of things. I mean, we was a whole agenda. We went through it. There was an agreement on everything, um, but it had been a, a, a while since we had actually had a meeting that we had gone through many, many things. I mean, the mayor has called me uh, many times when he was running for president before we get on the phone and talk about things, but this was a, you know, a long meeting to go over a series of things that are coming before the council quickly um, and where individual members have raised concerns to me. And we talked about those issues in an in-depth way with hopefully a plan to move forward. But again, everything is still a moving target. Um, and I look forward to uh, you know continued negotiation on all of these issues that we're gonna be faced with this fall. Did you bring anything to Commonwealth? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, no, he didn't seem depressed. He did not cry, and he did not seem depressed. I ate too many Kit Kats, but that was it. I mean, I think, you know, he ended the campaign officially at Gracie Mansion on Friday. He was at the uh, unbelievable march that the young people of New York City had a few hours later. He was at the San Gennaro Festival uh, judging a meatball eating contest uh, the next day. Um, he had the rally on his retirement plan in the rotunda here at City Hall. So I think you've seen since Friday uh, a really busy schedule of focusing on uh, things that matter to New Yorkers, whether they be uh, your future retirement or celebrating the San Gennaro Festival by seeing how many meatballs someone could eat in six minutes. <laughs> so, you know, these are things, and I actually think that's the job of the mayor, to do both of those things, to, to actually be the champion and cheerleader of New York City uh, whether it's in Coney Island for eating hot dogs or Little Italy, Little Italy for meatballs, while at the same, he has not done that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't a meatless Monday meatball eating contest. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you know, you know, he, he's anyone in any position, whether it's a local council member, a speaker, uh, a mayor. When you're getting towards your time, the end of your time in office, you're thinking about your legacy. You're thinking about the unresolved things. You're thinking about what are some of the big issues in your individual district or in the city or in your borough that you're seeking to address. And so I think that's likely something that is on his mind. It's on all of our minds mm -hmm. as we reach the end of our time in the council. And I'm sure it's in his mind in reaching the end of his time at City Hall. Any other questions? Yeah, Joe. Great. Does that mean, do you, do you, did you get an update on where the negotiations stand? They're participating, um, and I welcome Greg Russ to, to participate in the working group. I think it needs to be a consensus plan that the residents have to have a very significant say in uh, for the future of their developments, and that's what this working group is about, is giving them a voice uh, in tandem with the elected officials um, to figure out what is the best plan moving forward. Um, and you know, there are really significant concerns. We have concerns, the elected officials, around demolition. We have concerns around what RAD would actually look like. We have some of these concerns that the residents have. So I think this working group will allow us the space and the uh, room to have these conversations um, to hopefully come up with a plan that is a consensus driven plan that the tenants and residents actually lead uh, in part of that working group. And so I'm glad that Greg Rest is gonna be part of it. I'm looking forward to the working group getting off the ground. I know that uh, the borough president and the state senator and the assembly member and the congressman are all looking forward to it getting off the ground as well. And I think, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of delayed. Hopefully it will happen soon.
No, it's not going out next month. I mean, that's my understanding. It would be um, inappropriate to go out next month. This working group needs time to actually get through a uh, process. And that process may be two months, it may be three months. I don't know how long the process is, but we're gonna see what comes up during the process. All the elected officials remain united uh, in figuring out a path forward that works for the tenants and residents um, of these uh, NYCHA developments. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you know, it has to be part of a, a budget conversation. And, you know, we at the council don't negotiate labor contracts. The mayor does that with his labor commissioner. But I think we have very adeptly uh, and strategically used our voice and our leverage in the budget process to gain greater parity for early child care workers, for uh, people in DA's offices who are being underpaid for legal service providers uh, where they, there was a significant pay disparity. We look forward to using our voice uh, and our leverage to similarly shine the light like the New York Times did this weekend on this significant pay disparity and ensuring that there is a path forward for equal pay for these uh, EMS workers who are putting their lives on the line every single day and saving countless New Yorkers. Any other questions? Oh, you'll have. I haven't read the full report, but I got some of the top lines from the, the staff here, and then I read the coverage actually surrounding it, and I was really disturbed because when we passed the GPS bill earlier this year, Councilmember Kalos's bill, and we had a hearing, uh, you know, less than a year ago with the school's chancellor, it was at the beginning of his time as school chancellor, uh, and with the head of um, the, the person he brought in to try to transform uh, bus transportation for kids in New York City. And we had a really contentious hearing with them and they said, we screwed up, uh, we need to do better, uh, we're not opposed to these bills, there should be accountability. Then we passed the bill, we negotiated with them, we figured out a time frame that works, and then you saw at the beginning of school just a few weeks ago, a significant number of the devices not turned on, and you saw, I think, uh, from what I read, it looks like incompetence related to top-level staff that are supposed to be protecting children and getting them home on time and letting their parents know where they are in a real-time manner. And so that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable when the city is spending tens of millions of dollars and we pass legislation and we have a hearing and we have a commitment from the chancellor and we have a commitment from the administration and topable staff at DOE to us over the course of many, many months who tell us they're gonna, ch they're gonna change it, they're gonna get it right, it's gonna be ready for the start of the year. It isn't, which is why we saw the report. And then we saw the reporting on, I think, the dysfunction that we're seeing in the Office of Pupil Transportation. So I have significant concerns. We are internally looking at what our next steps are and what, should we do, what we should do now, but they need to come into compliance as quickly as possible and get people there that know how to turn the system around as quickly as possible because no parent should be wondering where their child is 30, 40, an hour, two hours, three hours after that child is supposed to be home or at their local bus stop. Any other questions? Steve, did, Levin, did you want, did you want to say anything? Okay, thank you all very much.